Kere, visitor. You are about to embark on a journey of discovery through the rich and fascinating history of classical Greece. You'll become fully immersed in the painstakingly detailed world built for Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which you are free to explore at your own pace, without any danger or time pressure. For a directed experience, take one of the many guided tours curated by prominent historians and archaeologists. Along the way, exchange words with some of Greece's most famous historical persons. The classical Greece you are about to explore is at the peak of its glory. This period is synonymous with grand accomplishments of the physical and the mental. Architectural marvels which still stand today dot its landscape, while towering achievements in philosophy, Political systems and art still influence our modern society in profound ways. We hope you become engrossed in the dazzling riches of ancient Greece and welcome you to your visit. Greetings, wanderer, and welcome to the Acropolis, the shining jewel of Athens. The Acropolis of Athens is a bastion of art and culture worthy of the gods themselves. Within this citadel, you will find many important sacred buildings, as well as some of the most magnificent art in all of Greece. You are in for a very enlightening visit. When you're done, come find me, and we can discuss the things you have seen. Farewell for now. The Acropolis has gone through many changes in its long history. It began as a simple rock, was settled as early as the Neolithic period, and then became a fortress in the Mycenaean period. Stone buildings started appearing in the 7th century BCE, but the famous structures whose ruins remain visible today date mainly from a period of construction in the 5th century BCE. The location of the Acropolis is closely tied with Athens' foundation myth. Supposedly, it was the site where Athena and Poseidon competed for the city's patronage. This connection gave the Acropolis a sacred aura, and it was considered the religious heart of the city. The Temple of Athena Nike was built on the remains of old fortifications from the Mycenaean era. Worship at the temple can be traced back to the 6th century BCE, but the building itself was destroyed during the Greco-Persian Wars a century later. It was rebuilt during the Peloponnesian War. Given that the name Athena Nike roughly means Athena of Victory, it was likely constructed in the hopes that Athens would win the war. Unusually, the temple depicts historical scenes of battles against the Persians instead of the more mythologically inclined art of other Greek buildings. The temple's priestess was chosen randomly among the Athenians, and received a salary of 50 drachmae annually, along with skins and trophies from sacrificed animals. The Acropolis was built up over a long period, due in no small part to its partial destruction during the Greco-Persian Wars. It was in the 5th century BCE, though, that the Acropolis received its most significant improvements. This period was an extremely prosperous time for Athens, both financially and culturally. With a booming economy bolstered by trade and the Lavrion silver mines, Pericles, the leader of Athens, financed a huge project to rebuild the citadel. He enlisted the help of renowned artists, like the sculptor Phidias, as well as the architects Ictinos and Callicrates. Together, they erected buildings like the Parthenon and the Propylia Gateway. Pericles' goal was to make the Acropolis into a glorious monument to the gods and to mortal Athenians.
Behind the Propylaia was the giant bronze statue of Athena Promachos, or Athena who fights on the front lines. That name was reflected in the spear and shield the statue held in its hands. It was erected in the mid-5th century BCE by the artist Phidias. According to an inscription, it took nine years to make and cost almost half a million drachmae. At approximately 10 meters tall, the statue was apparently so large that Pausanias claimed its helmet and spear tip could be seen from the sea near Cape Sunion, 60 kilometers away. The ornamentation on the statue's shield was engraved by the metalsmith, Mies. The Arafuroi were young girls between the ages of 7 and 11 who were in charge of special rights. A list of four girls was drafted by the Assembly of Citizens, from which the High Magistrate, the Archon Basileus, chose two to serve as Arafuroi for the year. The girls lived in a house on the Acropolis. They were in charge of carrying sacred objects and weaving the peplos of Athena. The peplos was a sacred robe offered to Athena during Panathenea, a festival held in her honor. Oh. The Erechtheion was an atypical temple. It was dedicated not only to Athena Pelias, but also to Kekrops, the mythical founder of Athens, his son Erechtheos, and even Poseidon, the sea god who challenged Athena for possession of the city. The temple was divided into sections. The eastern part housed a statue dedicated to Athena, while the western section jointly belonged to Poseidon and Erechtheos. Meanwhile, King Kekrops' grave was believed to be under the caryatid porch. Under the temple was a crypt that was said to contain the sacred snakes of Athena. The snakes may have had a sweet tooth because the priestesses of Athena allegedly fed them honey cakes. The Parthenon is one of the most well-known buildings in the world and an enduring symbol of ancient Greek civilization. While it is located on the Acropolis, the building is not a traditional temple. It was built by the sculptor Phidias and the architects Callicrates and Ictinus as a great monument to the glory of the city of Athens. That glory is evident in its many carvings. One of the most carved monuments in Greek architecture, the Parthenon's decorations depict several mythological scenes. These include the birth of Athena, her fight against Poseidon for the patronage of Athens, the gods' battle with the giants, and the procession of the great Panathenea. The Parthenon's inner chamber, or cella, contained a massive statue of Athena that was considered to be one of the sculptor Phidias's greatest masterpieces. The statue was chryselephantine, a combination of gold and ivory. To justify the steep cost of its construction, Pericles told Athenians that the statue was a gold reserve which could be disassembled in times of economic distress. The cella also allegedly contained a pool whose main purpose was to control the room's humidity, which helped preserve the statue's ivory.
Athens treasury was located in the Parthenon, where it was believed to be protected by Athena herself. The treasury contained objects of great value, acquired from different conquests, as well as a mass of... Pericles also decided to move the entirety of the Delian League's treasure to the Parthenon in 454 BCE. This was a great testament to Athens' power over the rest of Greece. The riches were divided into two parts, the Demosia, which belonged to the city, and the Hiera Cremita, which was dedicated to the goddess and only used for religious purposes. And what did you think of the Acropolis? It truly is quite something, isn't it? A sacred sanctuary and an architectural marvel, all in one. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. As you wish. Hopefully we will see each other again soon. Welcome, traveler, to the ruins of Mykine. These are the ruins of Mykine, center of the old Mykinian civilization. It was home to great warriors and heroes. In many ways, places like Athens and Sparta stand on the shoulders of its accomplishments. This tour will take you through its ruins and introduce you to its most important monuments, revealing its history in the process. I hope you enjoy yourself. I'll be waiting for you at the end of your visit. The Mycenaean civilization flourished in the Late Bronze Age between 1600 and 1200 BCE. During this period, it was mainly located in the Peloponnese and Central Greece. Mycenaeans were known for exploring distant lands. Notably, they battled the Hittite allied city of Walusa in a conflict that was believed to be the inspiration for Homer's Trojan War. But the Mycenaean people didn't only travel to fight. They learned much from their neighbors, the Minoans of Crete, such as how to write syllabic script on clay tablets. Such tablets provide evidence that Mycenaeans spoke an early form of Greek. They also tell of how great Mycenaean kings ruled over their warriors from opulent palaces in places like Mycenae, Thebes, and Knossos. The entrance to Agamemnon's citadel, or the Lion Gate, is one of the most iconic monuments in Mycenae. It is impressive for both its height and for the intimidating rendering on its relief which depicts two lions standing on either side of a column. Unfortunately, the lion's heads, which were presumably made of a precious metal or higher quality stone, have been lost to time. The gate was most likely meant to greet a triumphant king returning home from successful military campaigns and to awe foreign visitors. When these shafts were discovered by archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann in 1876, he believed the six gold-filled graves to be connected with the family of the great king Agamemnon, even going so far as to proclaim a gold mask he found within to be the death mask of Agamemnon. However, this was refuted by later excavations, which showed that the 19 bodies buried in the shafts dated back to a few hundred years before Agamemnon was even born. In fact, at the time of the body's burial, the Lion Gate and the Citadel Walls had not even been built yet. 
It's estimated that the people in the graves were members of the first Mycenaean dynasty. The graves later became a place of worship for Mycenaean kings, who raised walls to protect them. These walls helped preserve several incredible artifacts, including women's jewelry, death masks, and masterfully crafted weapons. By 1250 BCE, Mycenae was at the height of its power, and its living quarters and workshops were numerous. Houses were built everywhere, from the top of the palace's hill near the king's residence, to the slopes and terraces within the walls, to the nearby hills outside the citadel. At one point, the citadel's walls even had to be enlarged to make room for more quarters. The people who lived inside the citadel were those with high status in either the military, religious, or administrative sectors of the kingdom. This is reflected by the ceramic and metal vessels inside the houses, as well as their painted plastered walls. A traveler seeking an audience with the king would have first ascended a steep ramp from the Lion Gate to the Citadel's summit. Here, they would have walked into the palatial complex through a grand entrance called the Propylon. Once inside, their gaze would immediately be drawn to the palace's main hall, a monumental area known as the Megaron. The vividly decorated Megaron, which glittered with precious objects and colorful frescoes in its heyday, was where the king would have received the traveler. If the king was feeling generous, he would have shared with the visitor the palace's most marvelous feature. Its commanding and majestic view, which stretched from the plain of Argolis to the gleaming Aegean Sea. It was in this palace where a legendary Mycenaean king like Agamemnon would have held court. According to Homer and other poets, Agamemnon led the Greeks in the sack of Troy. Stories say that he was a fearsome warrior on par with Achilles, but also an overly ambitious and arrogant ruler. He sacrificed his own daughter, Ephigenia, to convince Artemis to grant his ship's passage to Troy. After conquering the city, he returned to Mycenae with mounds of riches and a Trojan named Cassandra as his concubine. Agamemnon's wife, Clytemnestra, was not pleased with her husband's sacrifice of their daughter. She plotted to murder her husband out of anger. The plot was successful, and, depending on the version of the story, Agamemnon was either murdered in his bath by Clytemnestra or killed by his cousin Agisthus during a banquet. You've completed the tour. I trust it was an eye-opening experience. Though it did not last, Mykene was a sort of precursor to what would eventually become the Greek civilization we know today. It's important we remember them, if only to avoid repeating their mistakes. Now, what else would you like to do? Then, I suppose this is farewell. At least for now. Safe travels. Welcome, friend, to this especially sacred part of the Olympian Sanctuary. The Sanctuary of Olympia was dedicated to Zeus, King of the Gods. It had close connections to the Divine, as you will see very soon. I'll come find you when you're done, and we can talk about what you've learned.
This workshop was built for the renowned sculptor Phidias after his work on the Acropolis of Athens. In 435 BCE, Phidias came to Olympia to begin working on the great chrysolophantine statue of Zeus. He died five years later, shortly after completing his masterpiece. This grand statue would become one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Phidias's workshop was located right next to the temple of Zeus. Its structure has been well preserved, mostly owing to its conversion to a church in the 5th century CE. Archaeologists have also discovered lots of ancient materials in the surrounding area, such as casting molds and sculpting tools. The most famous artifact, however, is a cup bearing an inscription that aggressively states, I belong to Phidias. On the fifth and final day of the Olympic Games, victors attended a ceremony where they were crowned with olive wreaths and showered in flowers. The crowns came from the sacred olive tree of Zeus, which was planted near. A young boy trimmed the branches with a golden sickle before giving them to the Helenodikai to turn into wreaths. After the crowning ceremony, it was time for great feasting and celebration. Pelops was both a legendary Greek hero and the mythical founder of the Olympic Games. According to legend, Pelops fell in love with the beautiful Hippodamia. Her father, Oinomaos, the king of Pisa, disapproved of their union. Having once heard a prophecy that he would be killed by his son-in-law, Oinomaos was known to challenge his daughter's suitors to chariot races, killing them when he won. Still... Pelops was determined to win Hippodamia's heart. Before the race, he enlisted the help of Poseidon, who gave him a golden chariot with four winged horses. Pelops was able to win both the race and the hand of his beloved, while Oinomaus was dragged to death by his horses. The start of this famous race was depicted on the eastern pediment of the Temple of Zeus. The Herion was a temple dedicated to Hera. It is one of the oldest temples in the sanctuary, dating back to approximately 590 BCE. The structure included columns painted with images of women who won the Heraia, an athletic competition made up of running events. Every four years, 16 women were chosen to make a veil dedicated to Hera. These women also organized the competition though they did not compete in it. The Haraya was unique for its focus on female athletes, in contrast to the male-exclusive Olympic Games. Hera was the goddess of women, marriage, family, and childbirth. She ruled Mount Olympus as queen of the gods, along with her husband and brother Zeus. Many mythological stories paint her as being annoyed at Zeus's many lovers and illegitimate offspring. In Greek art, Hera is usually depicted as matronly and regal, often wearing a crown or sitting on a throne. She is also sometimes seen holding a pomegranate, a symbol of both fertility and death. Hera's cult was very popular across Greece, and Olympia even minted her image on its coinage.
One of the highlights of the Olympic Games was a ceremony that took place on the third day of the festival. It began with a procession of athletes, ambassadors, Helenodikai, and animals. The group made their way around the Altis until they arrived at the Temple of Zeus. Then the animals were brought in front of the altar of Zeus and offered as a sacrifice. This sacrifice was known as a hecatome, a word that originally described the sacrifice of 100 oxen. During the hecatome, the bones and legs of the animals were burned and carried to the top of a mound of ashes from previous sacrifices. Meanwhile, the meat of the animals was saved for a large banquet held later in the evening. The Olympic Games were dedicated to Zeus, and all the ceremonies and events were hosted in his honor. It is no surprise that the largest temple in the sanctuary was the Temple of Zeus. While most temples were restricted to priests, the Temple of Zeus welcomed all who visited Olympia. This openness was most likely meant to show off the gold and ivory statue of Zeus that stood within the temple's walls. The building also featured art depicting both versions of the Olympic Festival's founding myth. The eastern pediment showed a scene from the legendary race between Pelops and Oinomaos. The temple's metopes, meanwhile, showed the twelve labors of Heracles, the other mythical founder of the games. Zeus was the god of sky and thunder and king of the Olympians. He ruled the world from his home on Mount Olympus. The child of Cronus the Titan, Zeus overthrew his father and cast the Titans out in a great battle known as the Titanomachy. He had children of his own with his wife Hera, including Ares, Hephaestus, Hebe, and Ilithia. He also had many children without Hera, much to her consternation but there are too many to list here. Zeus was believed to have control over the lives of mortals, as his many epithets attest to. For example, his title Horkios made him a keeper of oaths, while Xenios was the name conferred to him as a protector of hospitality. In Greek art, Zeus was usually depicted holding a thunderbolt and sitting on a throne, befitting his position as king. The Temple of Zeus was home to the Chrysalophantine statue of Zeus, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The statue, made of gold, ivory, and wood, was sculpted at 13 meters tall. It was as impressive looking as it was difficult to maintain. Oil was used to protect the wood and ivory from cracking and to prevent general decay. While the statue does not exist today, it was thankfully described by Pausanias in great detail, so its legacy lives on. Hello again! I hope you enjoyed your visit and feel a little bit closer to the gods. Well... As close as a mortal can get. Is there anything else you'd like to do? Farewell for now, my friend.
Greetings, Wanderer, and welcome to the Agora of Athens. The Agora is the beating heart of any Greek city. It is a place where all types of people may gather, from citizens and foreigners to magistrates and philosophers. All manner of business is conducted here, including political meetings, legal proceedings, and trade. When you finish exploring, come find me, and we can talk more. See you soon, Wanderer. The Agora was the civic center of Athens, but it wasn't only frequented by politicians and city officials. The area housed a market where people could purchase food and other goods from merchants. It was also frequented by philosophers who used the public space to establish schools and pass on their teachings to students. Religion had its place as well. Temples dedicated to Hephaestus and Apollo were located in the Agora, along with the altar of the Twelve Gods and the monument of the eponymous heroes. The painted stoa, or stoa poikile, derived its name from the panel paintings on its wall. The paintings were created in the 5th century BCE by famous artists like Polygnotus and depicted Greek military victories like the Battle of Marathon. The stoa served as a public meeting place for citizens, but it was especially popular with philosophers who used the space to pass on their teachings. In 301 BCE, the philosopher Zeno of Kition chose the Stoa Poikile as the location for his school of philosophy, the appropriately dubbed Stoicism. Trade in the Agora was supervised by magistrates. There were five Agoranomoi, who kept order in the market, controlled the quality of goods, and collected market dues. This provided revenue to the city and helped pay the magistrates and those in charge of maintaining order. The market benefited everyone. Customers bought what they needed, merchants made their living, and city officials received the money they needed to keep the wheels of democracy turning. <sighs> the original Temple of Apollo Patroas was built around 535 BCE by Pisistratos, but was destroyed by the Persians during their invasion a few decades later. It long remained in ruins, except for the altar, which was left standing as a reminder of the Persian sacrilege. Eventually, a new temple was built in the 4th century BCE. Inside was a statue made by Euphranor, the same artist who painted in the Stoa of Zeus. The temple held special significance in Athens as it was connected to the origin of the city's people. The name Patroos, meaning fatherly, referenced the belief that Apollo was the father of Eon, founder of the Ionian Greeks from whom all Athenians are descended. The temple of Hephaestus overlooks the Agora from the Colonus Agoraeus Hill. Today, it is one of the best preserved temples in Greece, owing to its conversion to a church in the Middle Ages. But while this transformation preserved the structure, it also damaged the surrounding sculptures. The temple was dedicated not only to Hephaestus, the god of metallurgy, but also to Athena Ergane, goddess of arts and crafts. Nearly every part of the Hephaestion was lavishly decorated with depictions of famous mythological events, like the labors of Theseus. 
the Theseus scenes gave the temple the nickname Theseon, a name that lives on today as a city district in Athens. The Buletarion was another building in the Agora that contributed to the democratic process. It housed the Athenian Council of Citizens, the Boule. This council of 500 was composed of 50 members from each Greek tribe, all of whom served a one-year term. They were chosen by lot from among citizens over 30. Every month, one group of 50 was chosen to lead the Boule's executive committee, the Pritineis. The Pritineus met every day of the month and called meetings of the full council in the Buletarion, where they spent their time discussing bills. The Pritineion was one of the most important buildings in the Agora as it was the headquarters of the Pritaneus. The Pritaneus was the executive committee of the Boule, who ran the city's daily operations. The Pritaneus dined in the Pritaneon, and 17 of them slept on site. The Pritaneon also housed the official weights and measures of the city. The fire of Hestia, which provided sacred fire for all public sacrifices, was also located there. The Heliaia was the most important court in Athens and was presided over by a group of judges called Heliasts. Judging was a regular part of an Athenian citizen's life with trials happening almost every day. Heliasts were chosen randomly based on two factors. First, that they were on the official list of 6,000 potential heliasts. Second, that they were present at court on the day of the trial. A stipend of two obols was established by Pericles to compensate for the loss of work while on helias duty, and also to encourage participation in the judiciary process. In the Agora, an Athenian could buy and sell many different products. The permanent retail market was divided into sections according to the category of merchandise. Merchants and craftsmen who worked in the market could be citizens, foreigners, or even freed slaves. They sold everything from food and clothes to jewelry and slaves. With so much variety, competition was fierce and that competition helped regulate the market's prices. The Heliaio wasn't the only court in Athens. This other court was located next to the South Stoa. Historians believe it to be a court based on the discovery of a nearby box containing seven bronze ballots. These ballots were used by jurors to give their verdicts. The reason trials were so common in Athens might have been related to their democratic regime, which promoted the individual's right to demand reparations for injustice. However, not all legal matters were settled in this fashion. If a claim was small enough, it was settled individually by a magistrate. Public trials were reserved for more serious offenses, such as murder, theft, and political crimes.
The mint was where the city made its coinage. It is believed that Athens' mint was in the city's agora, as modern excavations have turned up small disc-shaped pieces of metal used to make coins. Much of the silver required for minting coinage came from the Lavrion silver mines. Athens was so dependent on the mines that when they lost them during the Peloponnesian War, the city was forced to melt down a gold statue of Athena to mint gold coins and avert a monetary crisis. You have now experienced the Agora, following in the footsteps of countless Athenians before you. I hope the trip has impressed upon you how important this place was to trade, politics, and law. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Farewell, wanderer. May we see each other again soon. Visitor, and welcome to this sacred site. This is Delphi, home of the renowned oracle. Greeks considered it the navel of the world. Pilgrims and kings journeyed here from all over Greece and beyond, seeking advice from Apollo through the voice of his interpreter, Pythia. During your visit, you will experience the sanctuary through a pilgrim's eye and discover how important oracles and prophecies were to the people of Greece. Now, go off and begin your pilgrimage. I will be waiting for you at the end of your visit. On their journey to the Temple of Apollo, pilgrims walked this sacred path up Mount Parnassus. The summer sun beat down hot on their backs. Along the way, they took in the magnificent monuments, treasuries, and statues that adorned the road. These landmarks were tokens of people's reverence for the oracle's benevolence. All were dedicated to Apollo, and most were offered by cities to commemorate military victories. The monuments represented not only their donors' piety, but also their power and wealth. The sanctity of Delphi has endured to the present day, and visitors still take this very same route. One of the most impressive dedications to Apollo came from the Canidians, a Greek population that colonized the island of Lipari, north of Sicily. The story behind this dedication is notable. The Canidians were at war with the Etruscans in the Tyrrhenian Sea. Seeking a good omen, the Canidians consulted the oracle, and following her advice, they successfully captured 20 enemy ships. To thank Apollo, they offered the god the same number of statues as ships seized. Next to the Naxian Sphinx stood a simple structure to display offerings from the Athenians, most of which were spoils of war. In particular, these offerings, called ex votos, were prows of sunken Persian ships. The Athenians built the portico after their naval victory over the Persians in 478 BCE. Once arriving before the temple, pilgrims wishing to consult the oracle 
had to first pay a tax. This tax gave them the initial right to approach the altar of Apollo and make an animal sacrifice to the god. But before proceeding to the Pythia, the preliminary ritual had to succeed. If the animal reacted favorably and showed signs of acceptance to the god, it was sacrificed, and the pilgrim would be allowed to enter the temple to question the Pythia. At last, we arrive at the temple of Apollo, where the oracle relayed her prophecies. The temple was the final destination of those seeking an audience with the Pythia, and its appearance matched the majesty of its purpose. Atop its imposing columns, the structure's pediments displayed famous mythological scenes sculpted by the renowned Greek artist Antenor. But as grand as the temple looked from the outside, it paled in comparison with what happened within. Prophecies were given in the most restricted part of the temple, the Adytum, by a chaste woman known as the Pythia. Before delivering prophecies, she first purified herself with water, then burned laurel leaves and barley flour to begin the ritual. Finally, while seated on a tripod surrounded by offerings, the Pythia delivered Apollo's messages. Her words were often strange and indecipherable and required further interpretation by the temple's priests. Despite much research, the exact causes of the oracle's behavior while prophesying are debated to this day. Myths say that while searching for an oracle who could impart their words to mortals, Apollo established a sanctuary on Mount Parnassos. Apollo took over this site by slaying its sinister guardian, the snake-like Pytho. Your visit is complete. I hope you now understand how important this sanctuary was and how it affected the lives of people both in the Greek world and beyond its borders. To be honest, I could speak about Delphi all day. But what would you like to do now? As you wish. It has been a pleasure sharing Delphi with you. Greetings, wanderer, and welcome to the port of Piraeus. Acting as a port for Athens, Piraeus welcomed merchants, goods, and travelers from all over the world. It was a central part of Athens' economy, but it was also fortified enough to protect the city's considerable fleet. When you finish exploring the port, find me, and we will talk further. Piraeus, a peninsula southwest of Athens, became the city's main port after the politician Themistocles encouraged the development of its natural harbors. These developments led to the gradual abandonment of the older harbor of Phaleron. Piraeus's fortifications were further developed by Cimon and Pericles, along with the long walls, which ensured goods could still be moved during sieges. Piraeus was divided into three main sectors, the military port, the emporion, and the residential area. By the 5th century BCE, it had become not only Athens' naval headquarters, but also the mercantile center of the Mediterranean. Piraeus's development during the 5th century BCE attracted a large population. Many craftsmen, merchants, bankers, sailors, and ship owners moved to the port in great numbers. The population was a mix of Greek citizens, foreign visitors, and immigrants known as metics. The variety of the port's inhabitants gave Piraeus a cosmopolitan atmosphere. 
Most of the residents were involved in trade, but others worked on shipbuilding or in larger scale industries like shield factories. Horaeus's commercial focus offered many opportunities for those seeking to increase their wealth and status. One such rags to riches tale is that of Passion, a slave who eventually became a citizen and earned a fortune thanks to his bank and his shield factory. Piraeus was a demi, or district, of Attica. Because of its size, function, and varied population, it had a much more complicated administrative structure than other deems. Above all, Piraeus was closely monitored and controlled by the Athenian assembly due to its importance to the city. Within the port, there were two separate categories of trade. International trade, which took place in the Emporion, and retail trade, which was managed by Kapaloi in Piraeus's Agora. The Emporion was a commercial port dedicated to trading goods from overseas. All international transactions were required to be made within its limits and needed to be exclusively wholesale. Elected magistrates managed all business and laws in the port. Meanwhile, port authorities known as Epimelites oversaw trade and took care of the regulation of prices. This was an especially crucial duty, as the amount of supplies and goods could fluctuate wildly based on factors like bad harvests or lost cargo. Common products sold in the Emporion included vegetables, fruits, fish, leather, timber, marble, metal, weapons, and ceramics. According to Hermippos, Athens was also wealthy enough to afford the finest goods from all over the world, including figs from Rhodes, almonds from Thassos, oil from Samos, and wine from Chios. Taxes were collected on all merchandise that came into the Emporion, which provided Athens with a major source of income. After arriving in the Emporion, merchants set up samples of their goods in a display area called the Deigma. This was where citizens and foreigners gathered to officially make their deals and almost all merchandise that came into the Emporium was traded within the area. The Daigma was under constant supervision by magistrates who negotiated price control with the importers. They would occasionally give special privileges to those who agreed to sell at lower prices. These privileges ranged from tax exemptions to specially reserved seating in the theater. Piraeus was a deem, and as such, was supervised by a magistrate called the Demarchos. While most Demarchoi were chosen locally within their deem, Piraeus was appointed directly by Athens, so the city could better monitor its commercial interests. In fact, matters regarding the Emporion, the military harbor, and the grain trade were regularly debated and decided by the Athenian assembly. Transactions within the Piraeus were supervised by metronomoi. These were magistrates responsible for keeping track of weights and measures. They made sure merchants' measurements were always accurate to prevent bad deals and scams. Even though Piraeus would eventually develop into a city in its own right, it always remained under the control of Athens. A commercial tax of 2%, or a pentecost, was placed on all cargo entering and leaving Piraeus. The tax was collected by a group of five people called Pentecostologoi. According to Andocides, this position could be bought for the hefty sum of 30 talents, or 180,000 drachmae. 
However, most of these officials made a profit of up to six talents, making the job very lucrative. While merchants were responsible for setting the value of their goods, Pentecostal Logoi had the power to challenge the value, if they saw fit. Furthermore, merchants were required to register with these officials before they could transport, display and sell their goods. Overall, this system provided Piraeus, and by extension Athens, with a tremendous amount of money. The sale of grain was overseen by special magistrates called Sitophilikes. Since some Greek cities had a grain deficiency and relied heavily on imports, these officials were extremely important. Their duties encompassed all aspects of grain commerce, including price control and profit margins, to ensure Athens remained well-fed. This is no surprise. Grain was so important to Athens that two-thirds of all stocks were required to be transported and sold at the city's agora by law. According to Demosthenes, the significance of the Sitophilikes was such that if they failed in their duties, they faced the death penalty. The Emporion operated on a foundation of credit and loans. Overseas commerce was handled by two types of tradespeople. Emporoi transported cargo in borrowed ships, while Naukloroi were ship owners who moved goods on their own vessels. Elsewhere in the Emporion were bankers and accountants who arranged loans and kept track of incoming and outgoing ships. Emporoi and Naukloroi financed their maritime voyages with these loans, which often had a high interest rate due to the dangers of sea travel. Emporoi used the loans to pay for both the cargo and the right to a ship, while Naukloroi only had to pay for their crew. Loans and interest were repaid upon a ship's return to port. However, in the event of a catastrophe such as a shipwreck, the merchant and ship owner were released from their obligations and the losses were transferred to the lender. You've returned. I hope you enjoyed your stroll through the port. Piraeus was important to Athens' commercial interests, but it eventually came into its own as a vibrant and bustling port. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. As you wish. Thank you for visiting. Welcome, traveler, to the sanctuary of Asclepios, a place of rest and healing. This is the sanctuary of Asclepios, the god of medicine. It was here that the sick and weary came, seeking cures for their ailments. Sometimes the medical practitioners provided the cures, and sometimes the healing came from the gods themselves. This tour will help explain the inner workings of the sanctuary, as well as the unique way the Greeks approached medicine. I hope you enjoy yourself. I'll be waiting for you at the end of your visit. The ill and infirm came to this sanctuary to pray and offer sacrifices to Asclepios, the god of medicine. According to myth, Asclepius was once a mortal physician who eventually became a god. He had many sanctuaries across Greece, but the most famous was an Epidaurus. When pilgrims passed through the entrance of the sanctuary, they could read this inscription. When you enter the abode of the god which smells of incense, you must be pure, and thought is pure 
when you think with piety. Medical steles constituted a sort of hub between medicine, religion, and the divine. They were slabs with inscriptions that praised Asclepios's virtues and merit and described his methods of healing. The inscriptions relayed the dreams patients had within the Abaton, one of the most important buildings in the sanctuary. The steles outlined the patient's name, their disease, and how they were cured by Asclepios. They were probably written by the sanctuary's priests, or at least under the priest's supervision. Asclepius was a complex deity. In addition to being a god, he was also a trained physician and disciple of the centaur Chiron. In ancient Greece, religion was inseparable from rites, processions, and sacrifices. This was no different in Epidaurus, and visitors to Asclepios's sanctuary needed to prepare themselves accordingly. Pilgrims cleaned themselves in order to be pure, then offered Asclepios food like honey cakes, cheesecakes, baked meats, and figs. The food was placed on the sanctuary's holy table, where it was presumably later taken by priests. After the preliminary offerings, visitors were allowed to enter the Abaton, where they would hopefully encounter Asclepios in a dream. Medical steles also mention that healed patients sometimes gave additional offerings to Asclepios as thanks for being cured. Asclepius was originally born a mortal and was the product of an affair between the god Apollo and a mortal, Coronis. Apollo killed Coronis after discovering she had been unfaithful and ordered her body burned on a funeral pyre. However, he rescued his unborn child from Coronis's womb before the fire consumed her body. Apollo gave the baby to the centaur Chiron, who raised Asclepius and taught him to practice medicine. Over time, Asclepius became so skilled in the art of healing, he could even raise the dead. This angered Zeus, who sent Asclepius to Hades with a thunderbolt. Apollo retaliated by killing the Cyclopes, responsible for making Zeus's thunderbolts. Then, Zeus revived Asclepius, making him immortal and deifying him in the process. In sculptures, pottery, mosaics, and coins, Asclepius was portrayed holding a staff intertwined with a sacred snake. The staff is a symbol of medicine that still endures to this day. Epidotean was the priest's residence. As the link between patients and the gods, priests were essential to the operation of the sanctuary. They were often elected into the priesthood for one-year periods, but could also buy themselves a position if they were wealthy enough. In addition to interpreting patients' dreams in the abaton, priests both supervised and performed sacrifices and rituals. During these functions, they were usually clad in white. The Abaton was built in the northern boundary of the sanctuary, where it surrounded a sacred well whose water was believed to have therapeutic properties. The Abaton was where pilgrims went for incubation or dream rituals. 
Details of the incubation ritual have been described in unearthed medical steles. They were also noted in Aristophanes' play Plutos, which featured a more comedic view of the process. Incubation was the dream ritual pilgrims experienced in the Abaton. After completing the necessary preliminary rituals, pilgrims were allowed to enter the sacred building, where they lay prone. As they took in the smell of burning incense, the sanctuary's priests extinguished the oil lamps and asked them to sleep in silence. Once they were asleep, Asclepios would appear in their dreams and give his medical advice. The advice included diet and treatment recommendations, as well as requests for specific offerings or religious rituals. Upon waking up, priests interpreted the patient's dreams, unless a patient had been miraculously healed in their sleep. However, if a patient was completely beyond help, they were removed from the abaton. This was to adhere to a ritual law that stated that no one could die or be born within the building. I see you've completed the tour. I hope you enjoyed your time in the sanctuary. As you can see, gods and miracles were just as important to the healing process as medicine was. Now, what else would you like to do? Very well. May your quest for knowledge be fruitful and fulfilling. <laughs>